Okay, so the um the next thing we're reading after Descartes is um Rousseau's Discourse on the Organ of Inequality. And it's a bit of a leap um from those from the first text to the second text. We used to do John Locke in the middle, which was a really nice bridge, but um because we're trying to um make the reading list shorter, I got rid of Locke. I think we can understand a lot of Locke while looking at Rousseau, so um, I'll start by just giving you a little bit of background. Um, one of the things, uh, one of the quotes I love of Rousseau's is from a different text, but I think it encapsul encapsulates really well, um, uh, like the, the ethos of what we're reading when you read the Discourse on the Origin of Inequality. Rousseau says in, um, of the social contract, he says, man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. He who believes himself the master of others does not escape being any more of a slave than they. It's it's a nice quote to keep in mind as we're walking through some of this stuff. Um, Rousseau's text is all about how civil society has has basically enslaved us. Um, not to mitigate this concept of slavery, we'll talk about that later on in the semester. But it's kind of a it, I think it's an, a neat text. Um, before we get into Rousseau. It's really useful to look at the um, the intellectual movement that Rousseau is sort of responding to, um, and that's the Enlightenment. We don't really lump Descartes in with the Enlightenment, although you technically could because um, he's got a lot of the same ideas. But what we're really talking about is this sort of post um, Copernican revolution uh, set of ideas and and thinkers and you know cultural uh cultural movements that um specifically is a reaction to the scientific revolution so the sort of textbook definition of the enlightenment is the one that i've given you here on the slide um but if you remember back to our transitions lecture when we looked at renaissance humanism uh, the Enlightenment looks back to humanism, too, and it sort of takes humanism and combines it with all of the information we've gathered from the scientific revolution and, and, and tries to sort of come to some conclusions based on, uh, based on the stuff that we've already learned. So people are trying to, to analyze the world. They're trying to digest this new information, this new scientific information we have, um, understand what it means. And also, they're trying to improve the world. They're trying to improve human life and uh, the potential of human life. The Enlightenment is all about reason, right? So we talked a lot about reason when we looked at Descartes' text. Um, Enlightenment thinkers have this unshakable faith in the power of human reason. And so they use reason uh, as a tool to, to question and to... Uh, shake off all of the authorities that have governed European development since the Middle Ages. So um, you're using the powers of human reason to question the dominant philosophical paradigms, the political paradigms, the religious paradigms. We've, we've sort of seen that already with, with Descartes. Uh, the Enlightenment thinkers, however, so, so we talked a little bit about Renaissance humanism, and what's different between the humanists and the Enlightenment thinkers is that the the, the Enlightenment thinkers are really interested in finding certainty. Um, so they've been influenced by Copernicus, they've been burned by all of this knowledge that they figured out isn't true. Um, so they're really trying to combine the methods for understanding nature that the scientific revolution developed, um, to combine them with, um, with ideas that's going to let them arrive at a total comprehension of the physical universe, the workings of the human mind, stuff like that. So they're, they're really keen on the powers of reason to improve the world, um, individual and social life. You have, um, we call them philosophs, the, the thinkers of the Enlightenment, people like Diderot. They're not interested in like these abstract, lofty theories like Plato or something. Um, they're, really, they're really big on the practical. Um, ways that, you know, ideas can change society, can change culture. The way that they go about this is through criticism. Um, it's kind of a big deal, too, because they don't exactly have freedom of speech under um, absolute monarchies back then. So 
um, they're they're writing pamphlets and and letters and treatises and stuff like that. Kind of, and we'll see Rousseau sort of writing in that tradition as well. Um, so the the reason that I give you a primer on the Enlightenment is that um, Rousseau is kind of writing in the shadow of the Enlightenment. So we like to think of him as a, a transitional figure between the Enlightenment and the next um, intellectual movement that we'll deal with, which is Romanticism. Rousseau picks up on some Enlightenment ideas. Social contract theory is one that we're going to talk about, but he's very skeptical about specifically the way that the Enlightenment um, holds reason to such a high status. So that's one of the things we'll look at in this text. Uh, we'll start talking more about Romanticism when we get into Frankenstein. We can see Rousseau as kind of a predecessor of the Romantic movement, however, in the following ways. Um, first, Rousseau is very interested in, um, not in reason, but in feelings, in intuitions. Um, so because the Enlightenment was seen as the age of reason, Rousseau and, and others are, are kind of critical um, of that idea believing that there's way more to human life than, than just reason, right? We're more than just these rational robotic creatures that Descartes constructs us as. We have feelings and passions and intuitions, and all of these are really important to, to human development as well. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Rousseau's life before I get into the text. He has kind of a messy, messy childhood. He loses his mom when he's really young. Uh, his father deserts him. He just up and leaves when he's 10 years old and, and shoves him off with some relatives. Um, Rousseau is what we call an autodidact, which means he's totally uh, self-educated. Like, he doesn't go to school or anything. So, I don't know, it's kind of mind-blowing to read uh, the stuff that he writes and, and know that he never went to grammar school. Um, he doesn't get married, but he has this really long-standing affair with his servant, whose name is Therese. Um, they have... They have five children together, but what's weird is that they just give them all away to an orphanage. And I'm not going to defend that decision, but uh, Rousseau himself said he was not cut out for fa for fatherhood. So, um, you know, that's a sort of an interesting fact about his life. Um, despite his kind of humble beginnings, he's really intelligent, and he becomes friends with some really famous people, some really prominent thinkers at the time, people like Diderot and, and Voltaire. Um, Rousseau also contributes some articles to Diderot's Encyclopedia, um, which is, you know, basically the first encyclopedia of the Western world, so that's a big deal. In 1750, um, Rousseau sees uh, an essay competition that he, he is really interested in, so he writes this essay and he wins. And um, the, the sponsors of the essay competition was... Um, there were an intellectual group called the Academy of Dijon, and it's like a think tank or whatever. So they they posed this question and they solicited responses to it. The question that they posed um, is was has the modern advancement of the sciences and the arts served to purify or to corrupt manners and morals? There's some really, some really strong feelings on this topic. So he argues that modern advancements in the sciences and the arts have been totally corrupting forces. Not a popular opinion, but he wins the essay competition anyway, which is which is really cool. And that kind of puts him on the map. Um, the basic idea in the winning essay that Rousseau pens is, um, is something that you see throughout all of Rousseau's writing. It's this idea that humans were, initially they were born free, they were born naturally good, they were happy, um, but through the process of becoming civilized, uh, they have they have lost that freedom. They've lost that goodness. They have become corrupted. They've been rendered totally unhappy. So um, this is what Rousseau argues in in the little um, in the essay that he writes and wins the competition for. So I'm gonna I'll uh, stop that one. I'll stop this lecture here, and then I'll get into sort of the meat of the discourse on the origin of inequality.